we get through to preach here in just a moment, uh, Clint's passing out a sheet. I wanted to have you all to have this as it's part of the message this morning. Uh, it's not a test, so don't get worried that we're passing out a test or anything, but it's something that goes along with the message, and I want you to be able to utilize that as we preach this morning. We're continuing uh, in our series that we have uh, started a few weeks ago, uh, a Heart for Outreach. And this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 4, verses 35 through 37, as we're going to preach a message that we've entitled, Effective Outreach Using the Fran Plan. Uh, learned this of several years ago, and um, have taught it before, and, but it just is a, something that we can utilize to kind of help you in your walk with the Lord and in your outreach and you're witnessing to others. So uh, let's begin here in John chapter 4, verses 35 through 37. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you're entered into their labors. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to his word. We come to a time of preaching, and I realize what an awesome responsibility this is to preach the gospel. I pray that he would help me to think clearly. He would touch my mind and my mouth. Uh, then I pray that he would touch the ears of the hearers, that he would touch you as you're there. I pray that he would penetrate our hearts uh, and that we would be under his microscope, that he would thoroughly examine us, that he would change our minds, minds, our hearts, and our lives through the preaching of His Word. You know, this is the fifth message in our series entitled, The Heart for Outreach. As we have stated in previous messages, there are some principles of outreach, and we have shared these with these, and these messages in this series are about these principles and address these principles. Now, one principle is about sowing and reaping, and he mentions it here in this text also, but we address that in a message from Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 58, in a message entitled, How to See a Miracle in Outreach. And then another principle is involving every member, and we address that message in, in a message that we entitled, The Command to Be Involved in Outreach, from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. A third principle is reaching out by divine appointment. And we address that in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, where Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch by divine appointment and shared with him the gospel message. Last week, we shared another principle, which is we must have a heart for outreach. And the message was entitled, Seeing Outreach as Jesus Does, from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And we saw his heart. And we need to have the same heart for outreach that Jesus does. You know, recently someone said that they had a desire to be involved in outreach, but they were waiting for someone to ask them. But from Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we see we do not have to wait to be asked to be involved in outreach and to share the gospel message. We see it as a command to be obeyed. Jesus gave the Great Commission, and it's as you are going, you are to share with other people. But then we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we are to begin in Jerusalem and to go all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. It should be a part of our daily life. Uh, in, in the New Testament, Jesus did not sit back and wait for people to come to Him, but He went to where the people were. Nowhere does the Bible command that lost sinners come to church, but it does command us as Christians to go out into the highways and the hedges and to compel them to come in. If we were to take a survey this morning, we would find that most people did not come to Jesus, but they were brought to Him. Someone brought you to Jesus or shared Jesus with you. If you recall last week and, and several messages, I've shared that only 8% of the world's population is Christian, which means 92% of the world is lost. One out of 10 people at Walmart is a Christian, meaning 9 out of 10 are lost. Other research has found that 50% of Americans are unchurched, are not going to church on a weekly basis. 30% who do go to church say that they are members of a church, but they believe that living a good life will gain them a place in heaven. Given those statistics, it tells us that a great number of Americans are lost and on their way to hell. 
And let's put it even closer. A great number of people in Johnson City are lost and on their way to hell. There are people to reach and there is a work to be done. And our text this morning talks about working in the fields, harvesting uh, and reaping. There are people to reach. There is a work to be done. We dare not neglect people whether they live in a mansion or a slum, whether they are upper class or lower class, whether they are upper coming or down and out, whether they are young or old. We need to reach people. Our commission is to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we must get the salt out of the salt shaker. We must turn the light on and go out and share with the world for people to come to Jesus. Today we want to share with you a plan that we can use to reach our community. We have a diagram and a plan for doing what Jesus told us to do as we go out into the world and reach people for Christ. Now this is not a test. There's no right or wrong answers. But I want you to take that sheet that I gave you and I want you to look right in the very center there is a circle. There is five circles on that sheet. Right in the very center, and I think every one of you will get this one right, I want you to write your name. Write your name right in the center. You're going to write your name there in the center. And we're going to share the other circles and what they mean, the significance there, and we're going to ask you to write something in those too. But you know, the Bible tells us that we are an individual that comes to know Jesus. And when we come to know Jesus, we need to share with others. I'm reminded of that woman in John chapter 4. Did Clint mess his up over there? (laughs) I'm just kidding. I know the pen's not writing. You have to get a pen. But we, we find in John chapter 4, Jesus met a woman at the well. And on that day, she was gloriously saved. And the Bible says that she received Christ. And what did she do? She went out to tell others about this man, Jesus. She said, let me show you this man. Let me tell you what he did for me. But the disciples said, Jesus, you must be hungry. You've been sitting here. We, we walked a long distance. You've been sitting here for a while. You've been talking to this lady. But you must be hungry. And he said, my meat, my food is to do the will of the Father. You see, what he said there is food is temporal. But doing what God created us to do is eternal. And what he has created us to do is to bring glory to him and to share the gospel with other people. God created every one of us for the purpose of sharing the good news with someone else. Sowing seeds and reaping the harvest is what we see from the Word of God. He says here, the fields are white for harvest. The fruit needs to be gathered. I don't know of a day or an age in America where this has ever been truer than today. We are living in a non-Christian culture. Everyone does what is right in their own sight. Morals have become lax, and in fact, morals have been turned aside, and everybody does what they think is the best for them and doesn't care about anything else. Young people and adults don't think from a biblical perspective anymore. Cults are sending people to America, missionaries to convert people here in America uh, to their religion and their sect. And you know what? They're being successful because we have a generation that was not raised in church, doesn't know anything about the Bible, and they just listen to any wind of doctrine that comes along that sounds good. That's why we need to be sharing the gospel. We need to remember that people bring people to Christ and people bring people to the church. It's not television. It's not radio. It's not the newspaper. It's not the internet. 91% of people who come to church come because a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, or a neighbor brought them. Every person in this church is to share the gospel. And every person is a minister involved in the ministry of sharing the good news. Every person is a conduit through which God uses to share His love and His grace. I heard about this amusing, funny story. A little boy was selling newspapers. Now this was back in the day when you stood on the the corner and you sold newspapers and you shouted out the headlines or you you shouted out something like that. And he was standing on the corner and he said, Extra, extra, read all about it. Fifty people swindled. Extra, extra, read all about it. Fifty people swindled. Well, this man was standing there and he heard him shout that. He he was kind of interested and wanted to know what, what was going on, so he bought a paper. He read through it. He looked at it. He he said, son, I don't see anything in here about 50 people being swindled. Extra, extra, read all about it. 51 people swindled. That's what the world wants to do to us. 
It wants to give us the false news, the bad news. It wants to, to tell us there's a lot of people that are selling and giving or telling you something that isn't always true. They might swindle you, so to speak, but what you and I have to give is the greatest news in the world. It's the truth. It's the gospel. It's what will t take men to heaven. It will ha change their eternal destiny. So let's examine the plan that we can use to reach people with the gospel. First of all, in the top left or one of your circles, I want you to write the letter F, and I want you to write a friend. In Mark chapter 5, verse 19, we find a scripture there that tells us about, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. This man was gloriously saved there. And he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to make his abode with Jesus. And that's a good thing. He wanted to follow Him and he wanted to go home with Jesus. He wanted to be on Jesus' team. But Jesus said, go home to your friends. What I want you to do is if you know someone right now, write their name into that circle, a friend that you have that doesn't know Jesus, that's not in church. Now, if you don't know one right now, or if you don't have a friend, you have Jesus, who is the best friend the world can ever have. But I hope that every one of us has a friend that we can list there. And maybe God will convict you as we're preaching the message. You can write their name down. But see, Jesus doesn't want us to just get saved and then go home and sit down with Him and fellowship. He doesn't want us to just get saved and come to church every week and, and just fellowship with Him and, and not do anything. He wants us to go out and tell others. He wants us to go to our friends. He wants us to go to our hometown and share with our friends. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23, we find that Peter and John had been preaching. And, and, and they were put into prison. And, and it says here, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They went to their friends to tell them what had happened to them. They went to their friends to, to witness and to share the good news that God had been with them and let them go, that they had shared the gospel and preached and they were put into prison. Every one of us has a friend. I know we do. You may be here and you may say, there's nobody, I'm not a friend, I have no friends, but we've all got a friend. We've got someone who, that we consider close enough that we can call when we're in trouble, that we're concerned about, so we can write their name down. But I'm reminded of Mark chapter 2, verse 3. These four men, says, They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which were born of what? Four. Four men who had a friend who was sick of palsy and laying on the bed. Couldn't get out, couldn't do anything. And these four men carried him to where Jesus was at because they heard that Jesus was giving good news and was healing the sick. Notice that, born of four. These four men brought him. What is a good friend? Well, there's a lot of definitions about what a good friend is. And it's been said that you probably, a person only has maybe no more than five good friends in their lifetime. And it's even lower for men. For some reason, ladies, you have the ability to make close friends and to keep them throughout your life. But men don't seem to have that. They, they may have one or two friends. Or they make a close friend, but they part ways. They do other things. They get involved in life. But you might have one or two people that on your hand, you, you could count those people, and if you was in trouble, you could call them, and they would be there for you today. That's what a good friend is. You know, the, the old saying, the commercial was, real friends don't let friends drive drunk. But you know, a real friend is one who tells another about Jesus Christ. A real friend is one that's concerned about their eternal situation. You see, if you had a friend who had cancer and someone discovered the cure, the pill to cure cancer, would you not be the first to share with your friend? What people have today is worse than cancer. It's called sin. It's a disease called sin. And you and I have the answer. We have the cure. And it's Jesus. Let's don't keep it to ourselves. Let's share it with others. The second thing I want you to see, the second point, is the letter R. F-R-A-N. So in another circle, I want you to write the letter R, and I want you to write a relative's name. Do you have a relative 
that is not in church, who is lost, write their name down. In John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, we read about Peter and Andrew. It says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Do you see what we find from the Bible here? Andrew was led by John to accept Jesus. He had pointed others to Jesus. John the Baptist did. And Andrew was there and he received and he believed in Jesus. And the first thing that he did, he first found Simon, his brother. The best thing that you can do for a relative is to share Jesus with them. Bring them to Jesus. You know, the family seems to be the hardest people to share with. Maybe it's because they know Uh, so much about us and we know so much about them and maybe we get uncomfortable sharing with them but they're the ones that we should care about the most to share Jesus with we have something people don't have and something they need and we need to share it with them in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 it says thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up Giving your child Jesus is the best gift you can ever give them. It is more important than cars and clothes and classes and cash and candy. You need to be sure they know Jesus. Parents and grandparents, it's important that you share the Bible stories with those children as they're growing up. Read them to them. Let them ask questions and answer those questions. When you have a difficult time and you're facing something in your life, you can talk about Jesus to them and you can share Jesus with them. And they are listening, they're receptive to, they're they're just receiving everything. And they learn about Jesus at a young age. Have them in Sunday school. Have them to where teachers are teaching them about Jesus. Don't take it for granted. Will you spend eternity with your loved one? One of the hardest things to do as a minister and and preach a sermon when you know someone is lost or you don't know about their eternal security and the family members are grieving and they're hurting. You can't get up there and say, well, we know they're going to be in heaven if you don't know for certain, if if you've never talked to them and they shared with you. So you don't want to give a false hope, but you also want to, 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 to comfort them in some way. You need to make sure that when you die, your family members know that you're saved. So that the minister can get up there and and say those words with confidence. But you also want to be assured that family members who you love are saved and are going to go to heaven. So list a family member, a family member that you're burdened for, and pray for them and begin to invite them, share with them. The third thing that we want to do is the letter A. And this stands for acquaintance. An acquaintance. This is someone that you know, but not as close as a personal friend or or, or someone. It's just you you come in contact with them. So I want you to list someone that, that you have come in contact with quite frequently. You're not that very close to them, but you know them. You know their name. You know their face. And you can list their name. See, in Matthew chapter 22... Verses 9 and 10, the feast was made. Jesus compelled those to come in, but they, nobody was coming. And He told His disciples, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. You go out and you come in contact with people every day. People that you know in a casual way. You come into contact with them, maybe at work. Maybe uh, your kids are in the same uh, dance team or or soccer team or ball team. Maybe uh, you're in a, a club or an organization and you see these people and you just know them casually. But you need to know about them eternally and see where they are spiritually. See, like the woman at the well, she went running into town 
And I don't know that she knew some of these people that she came in contact with. They were not her friends. They were not her relatives. But she began to share with them. And you may say, well, why is it important that I list acquaintances? Because of the verse in John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The word whosoever. Whosoever. You see, we're a whosoever. Those casual acquaintances are a whosoever that Christ died for and that God loves. So we go into the highways and the hedges. We invite and bring people. And notice in that Scripture that we read before, they were inviting both the good and the bad. Invite everyone. So often we, we look at people and, and, and their, the way they look, the way they dress, so many things about them. Oh, they're, they're a good person. We can witness to them. But here's someone who's out on the street and, and they, they've had some bad things. They, they, they dress badly. They, you know, they, they, they may be involved in some things and we don't take the time to share with them. But he said both the good and the bad. Because we come into acquaintances all the time. People bring people to Christ and to the church. Studies show that we cross paths with un, seven unchurched people every day. We cross paths with people every day. But what are you talking to them about? So often we talk about politics. We talk about the weather. It sort of reminds me of that Toby Keith song. We talk about, it's all about me, me, me. You remember that song? I talk about the weather. You talk about, but you know, that, that's just, I digress. But anyway, we talk about so many things. You say, well, I can't, I can't talk about Jesus in the conversation. Let me tell you an easy way to do this. I, I got an email this, just yesterday, and I was reading this, and it was, it, was a, it was about witnessing and outreach that I get these emails from this organization. And this is the easiest way to do it. As someone is talking, you're hearing their conversation. Maybe they're talking about having a difficult time in their finances. They're talking about a difficult time in their marriage. They're talking about raising children. You're a parent. You've got the perfect opportunity when they talk about a situation in their life to come into the conversation and say, so you're having some trouble with your finances. Well, you know, several years ago, I was, I was lost and I, I didn't know Jesus. And, and someone witnessed to me. And Jesus has come into my life. And He doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't solve all my problems. But He has helped me with my finances. And you can tell them what Jesus has done for you right there on their subject. And you've introduced Jesus into the conversation. They may say, well, who's Jesus? And, and what about this Jesus? Well, that gives you more opportunity to share more about Him. But every day we are talking to people and the conversation that they start and initiate, we can bring Jesus into the conversation. I read about an example of a phone call that a pastor received. He was a pastor in Alabama. He was receiving this call from a young man in Tennessee. He said, I want to thank you and your church for changing my life. He said, one day we were in a restaurant and a couple came over and they made a comment about our little baby. How cute the baby was and how old the baby was and asked some questions. And they asked this question, where does this baby go to church? To which we replied, we don't go to church. Oh, you don't go to church. We would love for you to come to our church. We have a nursery. We can have your baby in the nursery. You can sit in the, in the sanctuary with me. I'll sit with you and help take care and watch the baby while the service is going on. Would you come? The couple not only invited them, but they came and picked us up and took us to church. After we went for several Sundays, we got saved. My wife and I got saved and we want to thank you for members in your church who would go out in the restaurant and say something and invite us to come. They didn't know us from Adam, but that baby that they were bragging about caused us to think about our eternal need of Jesus. We have moved away. We live in Tennessee now, but you have changed our eternal destiny because someone from your church shared with us. What acquaintances have you come in contact with just this week? You know, every day I, I, I do this. I'm going to lunch. 
And I usually, I like to eat at Food City because they have a variety of things. I can get by pretty cheaply there. Uh, and, you know, I can get soup or a salad. I can get something warm, chicken tender, whatever they have on the, on the plate that day. And every day you're walking in and people are walking out. Have you ever made eye contact with those people? Even to just say hello? But I, I pass so many different people. And you're going to see a variety of different people when you pass and go to Food City. And some look like they're just, it's the end of the world to them. Some are struggling to get their groceries out and push the buggy. And, and some, uh, you know, elderly people, they're struggling. And, and some are, are just happy. Some are wrestling with the kids, trying to keep them from getting run over by a car. There, there's all kinds of different people, and we see them and their acquaintances. Can we look for opportunities to share Jesus? See, we, we need to be concerned about them. See, another story that I heard about was uh, there was, a, there was a, a, some young people that was a church youth group. They had stopped the bus and they were eating at Wendy's. And they were sitting there and there was this one boy sitting there by himself back in a corner and nobody was around him. So a few of these young people from the church went over there to that boy who was eating alone. They went to talk to him. They found out that he was a runaway, that he was just living off the street. They invited him to Bible study. They, they invited him to their church, and he said, what's a Bible study? And they said, what's a Bible? What's a church? This boy had no clue, but this youth group had went over to invite him. They loved him, and they began to accept him. He, he started going to church there, coming to Bible study. He didn't know anything about the Bible, and sometimes he didn't act like he should be in church. But they just kept loving him. Eventually, he got saved. You see, all because someone saw an acquaintance and shared with them. One person saw, one person related, and one person witnessed. So you list an acquaintance there in one of the circles, but the last one is the letter N, as we're looking at Fran. This is neighbor. I want you to list someone who is your neighbor. Someone that lives in the apartment next to you, or the house next to you, or, 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 or somewhere close to you in your neighborhood that you know doesn't go to church, and you're not sure about their eternal destination. You see, Luke chapter 10 Verses 27 through 29, this Pharisee was talking to Jesus, this lawyer, and he had asked him who my neighbor is. And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? I'm just full of thinking it today, I automatically thought of the song. You all know it. Won't you be my neighbor? Everybody loved Mr. Rogers because he invited you into his neighborhood. He was concerned about you. Are we concerned about neighbors in our neighborhood? Zechariah chapter 3 verse 10 says, In that day saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. But who is my neighbor? Jesus answered the question of who our neighbor is. He said, it's any person in need. Now we, we go on in that story and we read about the Good Samaritan. The man had a need, both physically and spiritually, and this Samaritan helped him. But you know, people in our neighborhood have needs not just physical, but spiritual needs. A person in need. Someone that we can reach with the gospel. We have neighbors who are lost and unchurched. We have neighborhood watches. Maybe your neighborhood has the neighborhood watch. You put the sign up. You have those there. You're, you're looking out for those around you uh, that, that someone doesn't damage property or someone doesn't break into homes. Someone doesn't pick up a child or hurt a child out in the neighborhood. and It's a safe place to be. But I'm saying, it's great to have neighborhood watches, but what about in Nehemiah? We, we learned something there. We need neighborhood watchmen. The watchmen were on the wall. They were looking out for the spiritual condition, the things going on around them. We need those that are spiritual watchmen in our neighborhood. 
And when we see someone who doesn't go to church, then we begin to invite them. We need to be concerned for the welfare of our neighbors. It's a sad society that we live in that most of us don't even know our neighbor's name. Most of us don't have a clue who our neighbor is. Somebody moves in today, they move out tomorrow, another one moves in, and we don't take the opportunity to get to know them. We may throw our hand up, we may say hi, but we really don't get to know our neighbors. Now you can tell the different generations. In the old days, when you moved into a neighborhood, the older people flocked to you and and got to know you. And then if if there was children there, the children would come over and they'd be with your children or your children would be with them and and you'd get to know them that way. But you move into a neighborhood today, you may be a young couple, you move in and you've got some older neighbors and you say, well, they're nosy. They're like those neighbors on Bewitched. They're, They're always nosy. But you know, they learned that when they were growing up. Neighborhood was important to people. Knowing your neighbors... Being concerned about them was important to them. And we've lost that in our generation. So we need to be concerned. You see, when you bring someone into the kingdom, there's an eternal party starts happening in heaven. There's a celebration. When we reach our friends and our relatives, our acquaintances and our neighbors, there's a party in heaven. If you should die today, and you went to heaven, who is in heaven because of you? Who would say, I'm here because of you? We've all heard the song, and many of you know the words, but I'm going to share the words with you. It simply says, Thank You by Ray Bolts. I dreamed I went to heaven. You were there with me. We walked along the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing, and someone called your name. You turned and saw a young man. He was smiling as he came. He said, Friend, you may not know me now, But then he said, wait. You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. Every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. One morning you said that prayer and I asked Jesus in my heart, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you and said, remember the time? A missionary came to your church. His pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. One by one they came, as far as the eye could see. Each one somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, but in heaven now proclaimed. And I know up in heaven that you're not supposed to cry, but I was almost sure there were tears in your eyes. As Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord, and He said, My child, look around, for great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am alive. That was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. One day a teenager by the name of John who went to church and was saved, he he began to witness to some of his friends, one of his school buddies. He didn't know him that well. They they ran in different circles. But he still shared Jesus with him. and, And his friend Bob, Bob got saved. They both grew up. Bob became a very prominent, successful businessman. John, not the same. They had different lifestyles, different lives. But every time that Bob saw John, he always said two words. Thank you. Thank you. You see, you list a neighbor here. Someone that you can share with. And I want to close with the song that Steve Green saying, every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries 
that only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through His love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life that only we can share. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? I hope this message has spoken to our hearts that we would make decisions this morning. As we have written names down, maybe we want to come to the altar and begin to pray for them right now that we can reach them for Jesus as we stand and sing.